So again, welcome to the last cohort call of this cohort. Things have gone very fast, but today we are discussing a topic which is extremely important to what Open Life Science stands for. And uh, I'm really excited that we have two speakers on the call, Roland Mosbergen and Anilda van der Waal. Uh, as usual, this call uh, has a code of conduct. If you find anything which is not comfortable or makes you feel excluded, please uh, report that to the team by emailing team at openlifesite.org. You can also reach out to one of the team members if you would rather speak to them personally. Before we head over, please make sure you can edit your name to add W or S that stands for written or spoken so we can allocate you to the right breakout room. Um, so I'm just doing right now, I, I will, put myself for the written room today. Please choose one so it's much easier for us to assign you to a room. Add your roll call name and icebreaker question. Some really interesting answers are coming. And I'm really just excited about my, my favorite fact, which is that clownfish changes sex. Uh, when a female fish on the top dies, they change their sex and take her place. So think about that. Uh, Maya says that anything about babies and ocean is mind blowing. We have some think about the female bee worker are able to reproduce asexually. Wow. Some really great ones. I'll not go over everything, but these are really great. Um, and with that, I would like to again remind you of the topic. Uh, Open leaders design and build project that empowers others to collaborate within inclusive communities. And today our focus will be on inclusive communities. We will start today quite reversely. Like we will start by asking you to think about some questions. So if you can see the page number four, we have some prompts for you. And we will ask you to take 10 minutes silent docking, thinking about question, what place that made you feel included the first time you visited? It could be online or in person. What made that place so inclusive? Um, and I will cut the last question because we didn't ask you for taking implicit bias test. So please take six to eight minutes. I'll see how you're noting and then we'll come back to it before the first talk. I'll just start reading some of the insights and um, you're also welcome to raise your hand and share your personal thoughts. So the common idea that I see in most of the answer is that there was somebody who made intentional effort to create a chance to talk and introduce, set a tone for the community, explain things to each other, encourage them to take bigger roles, uh, respectful co-creation and also methods that reduces power imbalance and hierarchy. Uh, Fabian's comment about people were genuinely happy to see us. I think we can definitely read authenticity in people's behavior. So if we want to be inclusive, we need to be authentic. I think pretentious inclusion doesn't work. Um, Yo says that when she joined people in her team were talking about inclusion, equity and caring, and it was really supportive and kind and like-minded. So again, I think it's also about authenticity of people willing to talk about these kind of things. Javier has um, something about people from different backgrounds, including indigenous people. I think this is about, again, participatory research where knowledge holders are also the knowledge owners um, in terms of how research works. And then same was told by Batul, which is where she's in the carpentry's training where people are from different backgrounds, very supportive. Unfortunately, some of you have also expressed that you've not been to a lot of places where you suddenly feel included or have low threshold for inclusion. Sense of belonging is very important. So these were really skimmed through. So if you would like to unmute and share your personal opinion, that would be great as well.
So I don't see a hand. I'll selfishly read the Martinez com comment about the Turing way where people from diverse uh, background work together who are very approachable, but there are also chances where you can take a break from socializing and work uh, silently. I think we do have lots of co-working hours. All right, I think, please keep writing. I think these are really great examples for us to visit back and see what others do that make place inclusive and we can try to integrate those in our work. And with that, I'll hand over to you for the first speaker. Thank you so much, Malvika. Uh, so I am uh, really excited, uh, going to be introducing Roland in a minute. I'm actually going to just preface this with, um, I guess, a little bit of a content warning, just to say that the next talk, we're going to be talking about um, inclusion and about bias. Um, and I know that often when we examine bias um, in ourselves, especially, it can be really difficult and really uncomfortable to recognize that maybe we, we are biased or that we see bias in other people. Um, and bo both of those are uncomfortable topics um, that are also really important to face head on and recognize and figure out what you can do about it to try and avoid them and reduce bias where possible. Um, I will add a note that I know that I am biased. I try not to be and I do my best to work against it, but probably many of you may notice or feel the same. Um, I don't know where, <laughs> yeah, it basically, the next thing may be uncomfortable, but I think it's really important uh, to discuss nevertheless, and that we shouldn't shy away from topics, even if sometimes they are a little bit uncomfortable or um, make us feel bad. Well, okay, that feels really doomy. <laughs> really sorry. I think this is positive. Largely, that is to say that, um, you know, we, we care about bias because we want to make our communities more inclusive and better places. Um, with that, I am going to hand over to my friend Roland, who has been kind enough to stay up, I'm thinking quite late in Australia. So thank you, Roland, over to you. <laughs> thank you. Um, uh, can I grab access to share the screen? Cool. Try again, should be enabled. Yep. Can everyone see this? Let's get my stuff ready. Is that all cool? Excellent. That's fair. Okay, so when you asked me to do this, I was um, I was like, yeah, that'd be that'd be nice. But I was a little bit, I never really thought about unconscious bias much before, and I never really sort of drilled into it. And I've been working on diversity and inclusion things for for a little bit now. And uh, when she sort of talked to me about it, I, I said, okay, I'll write something off based on what I think, and then. You know, you can check to see if it's okay because I'm quite, as she said before, I'm quite. Um, I tend to get straight to the point, and that can be very uncomfortable. So, when I talk about unconscious bias, my question here is, does it really matter? And my first slide, woof, that doesn't work. My first slide is about this idea that this may challenge you, and uh, uncomfortable truths is a buzzword that pops up from time to time. And on the right here, you've got Ruby Bridges, who was six in 1960 when she went to a previously white school. There was a black baby doll in a coffin. And she was, you know, they threatened to poison her. She's six years old. And she was only allowed to bring food that she brought from home for her safety. And, and this is the challenging thing because this is not, this person is still around. She gives talks from what I can remember. And, you know, this is a really, this is change is not something that just happens very lightly with very minimal effort and people just go, oh, you know what? It's okay. This is, this is the, this is what happens when you have to, when you bring about change. So I want to ask people to think about, not write anything down, but to think about the bias that she received. Was it conscious or unconscious bias? And I want people to think about that for a few seconds. And then I'm going to give my take. So you got a six year old, people are threatening to kill her. Do you think that's conscious or unconscious bias? So my take on this is 
do you think it mattered to Ruby? Do you think that if someone threatened you when you were six years old, whether it was conscious or unconscious, do you think it would matter? And that's the sort of question that I want to ask across a few different other examples as well. So Tamir Rice was 12 years old when he was killed by a policeman holding a replica gun. Uh, he didn't make any verbal threats or point the gun towards the officers. He was shot and killed very, very quickly by the time the police had pulled up. It was a, a very short amount of time before he was killed. Do you think it mattered to Tamir if he was killed because he was because the police were consciously or unconsciously biased? Do you think it mattered to his family? In 2015, uh, just doing a search on racism in Belgium, I just picked a country. Uh, there was a situation where this person was uh, lost a leg after being chased by a police car. And on Facebook, uh, you had statements about the kind there, and there's more. There's more where that came from. Did it matter? Did his left leg feel? Did he lose his left leg, and was it worse because it was conscious or unconscious bias? Uh, you know, when you start to think about that, it all of a sudden this idea of conscious bias doesn't matter. It doesn't seem as important anymore to me, as a personal opinion. You might have a different opinion on that. Um, but it, I've shown you some really obvious things, but what is it's more subtle. So uh, this was really, this happened just recently where Vanessa Nakate um, got cropped out from, uh, from a photo. And uh, it was just bizarre when I first saw it. I just, it was just bizarre. I can't, I can't explain it, but it can be more subtle. And again, whether you're, when you're the recipient of this uh, subtle bias, it can hurt just as badly, whether it's conscious or unconscious, it doesn't really, uh, when you're the victim, it, it doesn't really matter from what I can tell. But bias also includes people who do similar things getting treated differently. So who gets forgiven and who gets punished? So one of the things that I like to, to teach people is to actually start to break down and say, well, can you think of another example where someone's been given a very different uh, situation where you know, they're forgiven or punished? So this is Brock Turner, who was uh, on the left, who's um, very famously uh, was uh, treated quite nicely because I think the judge recognized that he could have been an Olympic swimmer one day. And they thought that it might ruin his career if he was, you know, uh, you know uh, treated like a person or treated like, a, you know, as someone who has to bear the, the consequences of his actions. And then you've got uh, uh, Dayon Davis here who gets five years in prison for, for, sh for a shoe, for a shoe robbery. And I think it just really shows this idea, I, I call it uh, side by side. When you actually start to put these examples side by side, it becomes really easy to see who gets forgiven and who gets punished. Um, this is actually fairly close to home. So in Australia, in, in Victoria, in Melbourne, where I live, uh, there was a lot of um, COVID happening in the uh, rich and affluent areas. And people were just breaking things and this guy uh, was uh, walking around and, you know, no people were wearing masks, cafes were full. But in the place where there wasn't that much COVID, there were cops that were surrounding towers. And they found out later on that the, uh, the ombudsman for, I think it was a human rights ombudsman, actually was saying that um, that lockdown, having those police around the towers was actually a breach of human rights. And again, the, the housing minister for Victoria just said, we're not going to apologize for that. And again, it's like who gets forgiven and who gets punished. And uh, once you start to, to understand that and you can do what I would call a simple discourse analysis about who gets forgiven, and who gets punished, it becomes really, really obvious where those biases lie. 
And these biases are obstacles for people from marginalized groups. And I really love this uh, picture because it actually says, well, actually, I'm just going to judge you on who gets to the finish line. And they don't actually judge the degree of difficulty. Uh, and I'd also like to point out that when I talk about intersectionality, um, I'm talking about uh, having more belonging to more than one marginalized group. And so I like to think, well, don't like to think of it, but I think of it as a, uh, a power function. So if you're from, uh, you know, uh, it's exponential, it's exponentially more difficult to be a person from two marginalized groups than to be a person from one marginalized group. And incidentally, uh, actually, I'll might leave that one for a little bit later, um, that story. So for me, when you talk about unconscious bias, I'm thinking, well, actually, I think we should center the people who are marginalized. So when you're talking about unconscious bias, you're centering the, the perpetrator, you're centering yourself. And I don't think that's actually really helpful. And this one they're saying is like, you know, is it just an easy get out clause for behavior that's bad? And I, I don't really wanna be able to sort of focus on that. So I think what we should be doing is listening to the people who are the most marginalized in our society because they are the canaries in the coal mine um, and how comfortable they are, how, how well treated they are is an indication for how healthy that society is. So in Australia at the moment, uh, we are not a healthy society. We are not a healthy society. Um, and it's been like that for a while now. Because when you look at the most marginalized people in our society, they're treated really badly. And the way I like to think of how we adjust this is think of a triage in a hospital's emergency department. There's a lot of words here, you don't really need to think about it, but the more marginalized a person, the more we should help them. Because the people who aren't marginalized or aren't marginalized very much might not need as much help. So when you think about intersectionality, uh, and you're saying, well, if you've got more than one marginalized part of my, one marginalized group, it's almost like having a heart attack. You want to be seen soon and you want to be given as much help as possible. If you just sort of hurt your finger a little bit, you shouldn't be the one at the, the front of the queue. And in the following two slides, I've got a couple of graphs where I talk about um, who we're actually listening to based on their degree of difficulty. So this is what I call the intersectionality spectrum. And this degree of difficulty is something that I've sort of calculated. So I'm a big fan of George P. Box's quote, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And the reason I show this is because I know it's wrong, but hopefully it'll be useful. And what we do in Australia is we listen to people over on this side of the one. So white males, white females, they, they're overrepresented in a lot of media, in leadership positions, et cetera, et cetera. We don't listen to people over on this side um, because actually overall, like I said, we're, we're, we, are a sick society. we are a sick society. We're not a healthy society. And if you think about it from a triage point of view, and this degree of difficulty is actually calculated in a certain way. Um, you can sort of see it in the spreadsheet, but well, the way I see that we should do it, if we were to do it in a triage point of view, where this big arrow here is like where we listen to the most, that should be actually on the other side. We should be centering the people over on this side. And just to highlight here as well, I'm sitting here. So I'm actually extremely privileged when you look at, when you look at the people to my right. My, my family, my immediate family is all to the right of me. I'm the most privileged person in my family. And the way I think of things is how do I help people to the right of me? Because I don't necessarily need to help people to the left as much as I need to help people to the right. And then how do I center, center these voices? But it's not just important to listen, we have to show courage and act. So I don't, there's a couple of things in here that I just wanna show is um, what matters to people in one or more marginalized groups is how you're supported. And I think we mentioned a little bit more about that inclusion. It's like, you know, you feel supported, but you have to recognize that if you're, if you're neutral, you're on the side of the oppressor. Right. If you're neutral, the system is not going to change. It's going to say it's going to keep its momentum. But to act, <clears throat> to be to fight the system, it actually takes courage and a willingness to sacrifice your privilege to help others. So 
really interesting. The only person who agreed to teach Ruby, the six-year-old, was a white woman called Barbara Henry. Now, could you imagine what Barbara would have had to go through to actually do that? For a whole year, she was the only one who taught uh, taught Ruby. You can imagine going into the <laughs> into the staff room there, and I don't think you, she would have felt very included. And then, but the thing is, it's an act of courage to be able to actually fight the system. And that's that's not easy. There are many times where I have decided that I am not going to fight because I do not have the, uh, I just don't have it in me. So I was trying to find a quote, I couldn't find one, so I stuck my own in, apologies for that. Um, right, you can read it. You know, for me, inclusion is being comfortable to be able to say these things without losing my job, losing friends, or damaging my career. And I won't talk about this with my friends. I won't. So here's some, I always like to end on, I think this is near the end, is on practical things that you can do. You can change your social media as a sense of intersexually marginalized people. You can get out of your way to encourage people from marginalized groups uh, and identify talented people from marginalized groups who may not have had the opportunity. And the, these are ways that you can use to, your privilege to step aside to be able to allow people to have the opportunities that they've missed. And if you're up for it, looking at change, to change the systems in your organizations. And this is a really great example. And it's surprising how many times I've seen this in the music industry, where you have uh, someone who's got a lot of privilege who's saying, hey, if you give this person a chance, I will, I will make it worth your while. And that person became, uh, you know, be able to, you know, I never had to play a small jazz club again for Ella Fitzgerald. And that was a sign of someone sacrificing their privilege or using their privilege to provide an opportunity for someone else. There was another situation, I think Fred Astaire did it, um, Prince did it, well, the artist not formerly known as Prince did it as well. But uh, really, really interesting to be able to see those, those, those things happening. So in summary, for me, unconscious bias, yes, no, not really interested. For me, it's about centering marginalized voices and trying to support people from marginalized groups to your right in the intersectionality spectrum. Everything else is sort of not going to be as helpful for the people who are, who are marginalized. And if you want to know more, um, I recently tried to pull together a, uh, a workshop, um, a theoretical one uh, called Improving Diversity Inclusion and Senior Leadership, which has got some of these themes in there. And there's some other interesting things that are out there. In terms of centering uh, social media, if you're on Twitter, I put down this list, a public, it should be a public list of people to follow. And these are the people that are sort of high frequency tweeters, probably going to take you out of your comfort zone if it's not already, who uh, I, I use as my gauge and have really sort of, um, I've, I've followed, when I've started following, um, when I've started following marginalized voices, I learned way more than I've learned anywhere else. But there's a price to be paid. When I was talking about this to someone the other day, she said, yeah, I've noticed that I've learned a lot more, but I'm way more sadder than I was before. Because a lot of these stories of marginalized people are, um, yeah, they're not, they're not happy stories. Um, but you have to go through that process to be able to come out the other end and say, well, actually, it gives me motivation to keep uh, doing these sort of things um, to bring about change. So I think that is it. So I don't know what happens now. Do you want me to leave this share on, or do you want me to turn it off? Um, maybe turn it off. That way we can send to some faces. Uh, a couple of questions if anyone has any. If not, I do definitely have a backup question. Um, but actually, can we have a quick round of applause and thank you for the powerful talk from Roland. Thanks.
Uh, so if anyone wants to add questions into the notes, there is a Q&A uh, section. rather. Um, you're also welcome to unmute if you wish. So I will just share, um, I have a note here about the Dulwich Centre in Australia, which is a centre for narrative therapy and social work, which is sensitised to marginalised groups. Uh, that a person is a, one of the working principles is, I'm going to get tongue tied if I read this, person is not a problem, person is a person and a problem is a problem. Um, I like the framing, although I did have to read it about three times to actually not get tongue tied on that one, <laughs> as beautiful as that may be. Uh, Fabienne. Um, yeah, thank you, Roland. This was very, very powerful, and I really appreciate you sharing this and also being being so so honest and and, and vulnerable about it. Um, I think you you taught a very important lesson. You know, you 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 showed us that it's um, okay to be uncomfortable, that we need to be uncomfortable, and um, this is this is also part of I I think what 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 we need to do. Um, I wanted to ask you what what are your thoughts on um, the attachment to the goal of being more diverse and inclusive? I mean, almost everybody is now opening up um, the um, inclusion and diversity task forces. And um, I think that is very much driven by, um, you know, people want to help people are aware that they should be doing something but at the same time they are so attached to stepping out of this comfort zone by doing x and to me this particular attachment sabotages the efforts so what what are your thoughts on that yeah um so i guess my it depends how they step out of their comfort zone or if they're really stepping out of their comfort zone, if you know what I mean. So stepping out of your comfort zone, if it means almost every time, every day, you're making a weighted decision of whether you decide to push back or to grab an opportunity or to give yourself a break you know what i mean and you're sort of thinking if i say this will that ruin my chances of keeping my job and if you're not if you're not sort of if that's not sort of happening to you on a regular basis then you're probably you're probably going down that path where you might not be uh, like you're saying before. You might be fixated on something else. It might you might still be out of your comfort zone, but it might be a comfort zone that you're comfortable with. <laughs> I don't know if that if that makes sense, right? Um, but again, you know, it's I don't say this to say, oh, look, if you don't do this, you know, you're a bad person, and blah 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 blah. There's plenty of times where I've kept my mouth shut, right? Um, you really have to be able to pick and choose. Uh, I was in a, a meeting, I remember this really clearly, where there's this guy, he's actually a really nice guy. He was going, okay, we need to be able to get this group right, and I want to make sure we've got, you know, the right gender equity. And he was trying really hard to make sure he lined it up. He had an Excel spreadsheet where he was calculating, you know. But everyone was white. It was just completely, and I was like, he's such a nice guy. He's trying really hard. The institution is white anyway. You know what? I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna let this one slide. And, and you're 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 doing that every day. So my my sort of gut feeling is it's really difficult to know um, where that is, but if if someone's really pushing. Um, they're worried about their career, they're worried about their job, they're, they're worried about losing friends, they're worried about, you know, that's, that's really difficult. That's really difficult. And I think, but I think the only times that the, the big changes can happen, the, um, the, the really powerful changes can happen is when you actually when you, when you actually see what that means, 
right? You kind of know it. When I first had to do this sort of stuff, I kind of knew it, right? And I had to go right. And it's sort of like, oh. and in the middle of a meeting, I'll say, look, you know, if you want to make a complaint to HR, I'm, I'm happy to act as your witness. And, you know, I just go through this thing and be really upfront. And even behind closed doors, when someone comes to say, hey, do you think this was racist? And give me the story. I go, yeah, it was racist. Do you want me to, what would you like me to do? You know, you, you have to go through that thing. And, you, and even in the meantime, even if that's my supervisor, I go, shit, I don't really want to do this. I really don't want to do this. But we have to go through that process, whether we like it or not. And, you know, you have to decide if it's going to be worth your while. Um, because the dirty secret is, if someone in power is doing something bad um, and it's subtle enough, the only way they're going to get dislodged in most organizations is if things were to go public and the, the victim would have to destroy their career. If you've ever followed the lives of whistleblowers after the event, no whistleblower usually gets out of, you know, gets, 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 uh, treated like a hero from everybody. Like whistleblowers are, you know, they're not anyone's favorite people. So it's, it's a big challenge. I don't know if I've answered your question or not. I think I've just rambled around a little bit. Sorry about that. You're giving us so much food for thought. I mean, this is, this is nothing that can be answered really, or that can be, can be solved, but thank you for bringing it up. It's, like I said, it's really powerful. Thank you for setting an example. Thanks. Okay, thank you so much. I have, I think we have time for one more question if anyone has one and then we'll move on to the breakout rooms. I'm just checking in the notes. I don't see any others. Okay, I'm going to ask this one quickly. Um, so Roland, um, I definitely thought a lot about what you're saying, it, like even though I've read these slides beforehand, um, there's a lot of um, thoughts that still came came through to me when you were presenting this. Um, but uh, I guess it, I, I think that you're absolutely right that centering the people who are affected is the most important thing. But that then leads me to question if someone so I had a conversation, I don't know, six months or a year ago with a, a white person who said I'm not racist. And I remember thinking, I doubt that. <laughs> like you might not know that you're racist, but I think that that's a place where talking about unconscious bias so people realize that it exists and that they can act against it is important. And I'm curious how how you would go about raising that sort of thing whilst still keeping a victim central central narrative. Uh, yeah, so I actually do that in the um, uh, uh, you know increasing diversity and inclusion in the senior workforce, where I start out with. Uh, highlighting why I'm so sensitive and talking about the subtle, the, the subtleties of racism, because a lot of people think of racism in very uh, big, uh, easy to see uh, incidents. And actually the subtle ones, the subtle ones are more difficult for me now because people can go, oh yeah, no, that was definitely racist, blah, blah, blah. But it's the ones where people are trying to adjudicate when they're gray areas, the, the dangerous ones. So the way I would sort of do that is to take them through that, uh, especially those side-by-side -side examples. I really love the side-by-side -side examples. I wish I had more, but when you actually go, okay, you know, who's being forgiven and who's being punished and you go through these examples, it becomes really, really obvious. The other thing too, is I also, I'm also an experiential kind of teacher. So I like to take people, plus I'm a bit of a, what's a, what's a diplomatic way of saying asshole? I can't remember. Um, so I like to, I like to, <laughs> um, so I like to actually go, well, what would you do in this situation if you did this and this? And there's some really interesting videos now. And the difference now is that you can see when the subtle, when the subtleties come through, because it's like, but if you'd listen to the police, you wouldn't have been in trouble and then you actually show them videos of someone just standing there and then getting tasered for no reason and so i would 
I would tend to go, okay, if you don't think you're racist or you don't think there's like subtle racism, you take them through these situations. Okay, what would you do in this situation? I would, I'd follow the police, right? If you followed what the police said, you would have gotten tasered. And, and, and getting them to understand that there are different rules for different people by, by taking them through that, I think that will make them under, start to understand because it's not necessarily about whether they're racist or not, it's whether they actually even understand that these things are happening, which is why we want to center those things. And once, once they see that and they have some level of empathy, because some people don't, and once they have some level of empathy, then, then all of a sudden it can change in an instant how people view the world and we can't we can't make change unless we actually see that they have to go through that eye of the needle sort of thing to actually be able to come out the other side so i think i think that's how you could center the victims but also bring that person along for a journey but again they have to be sort of ready for it and the way that i'm setting things up is i'm only going to talk to people who might be willing to listen because if someone's not willing to listen all it's going to do is cause me pain and waste their time and uh, I don't have the energy for that so pick and choose is what I guess I'm saying you got to pick and choose okay thank you so much Roland uh, I think we're gonna wrap up on this bit and move on to our breakout rooms um, so yeah, th thanks again, Roland. Uh, this has been a really thought provoking and really, really useful talk. Um, so for our breakout rooms, folks, we have- Yeah, uh, uh, talk by an Ildan before the breakout room. Oh, okay. That helps because I was just thinking, how can I scramble to get everyone into the breakout rooms? Because <laughs> I hadn't sorted it yet. <laughs> Amazing. Okay, in that case, I get to hand it over to Maya who introduces our next talk. Thank you, Malvika. <laughs> Thank you, Yor. Um, so great. We have uh, Anil de van der Waal from South Africa, uh, who will uh, expand the personas and pathways topic is two key elements to designing your open project. And please, Anilda, um, tell me if you can share the screen. Okay. Thanks, Maya. I'm going to share my screen. Yeah. And recently, I've had some problems. So if you could just tell me what you are seeing. Um, share screen, that one. Share. It, you it works. My, you see my slides. Your slides. OK, that sounds good. Okay, no, I, I must say I'm, I'm, I just walked in at the end of that. Oh, and Aldo's up now because I had to quickly open the door for my son to come in. He's just back from school. So <laughs> just getting myself ready quickly, making sure I've got everything here. Okay. So thank you very much, Malvika, Yo, Bernice, um, and Emmy for the invitation to speak here today about pathways and personas. Um, it's a topic that I'm still learning about as much as you are. So I'm going to share with you my experiences and what I think about it. Um, but, and there are lots of resources out there that you can follow to look at how to do it. I'm going to talk more about um, kind of the, the whys and um, how to think about it. Uh, I really enjoyed Roland's talk now because the way that he used real people um, and in my talk you'll see less of the real people but we can refer back to to think about Roland's photos of real people when we when we're going through this talk as well so I'm an elder van der Walt. I'm a South African live, living in South Africa all my life um, many generations now I live in a small coastal village there's a photo of what you can see when you climb the hill just behind my house um, and I work with universities across South Africa, um, in Africa and, and outside of Africa to help researchers adopt technology in their research. Um, what I'm going to talk to you about today, as we said, was uh, personas and pathways, which are two design elements um, that have different benefits in your project. 
It doesn't only help you to think about designing the right project, but it also helps you to communicate within the project and to your stakeholders about design decisions that you've made. And of course, it helps you to attract the right users um, and contributors and help them to stay in your project. So for many of you uh, are doing very different projects before this talk, I was I quickly looked at the list of projects again it's so diverse. And some of you might be thinking, well, personas and pathways aren't really relevant to my project, but regardless of what kind of project you are doing in open science, um, personas and pathways can really help you a lot. So I hope by the end of this project, you'll see uh, at the end of this talk, you'll see a few ways in which you can use it. So you will need personas and pathways if you want users and or contributors. Um, and for all the projects that is in the OLS code, definitely this is what we want, right? Um, just very quickly, what are personas? Um, and very recently I was going through a, uh, the process of creating personas for a project. And I was looking at various personas online, various resources, and I was stunned to see how many personas seem to be created to tick boxes to um, to really really just not necessarily speaking to the people that might be coming to their projects. According to Mozilla, persona is an imaginary user based on real world observations and understandings of actual uh, potential current users, and in our case, also contributors. Um, but what's really important is that you have to know your audience. You have to know the people that you're working with um, to be able to create an accurate persona. And that's where data comes in. I think most of us um, in the school, definitely in the, in the OLS projects, are um, aware of the importance of data to inform decisions. Um, so maybe at the beginning of your project, you may not really know your users or your contributors. Um, and we'll, we'll speak a little bit more about that later. So your, your personas might not be that accurate, but as you go along, you can improve those personas as you get to know your users better. And as your um, project grows in terms of diversity and voices. Pathways are um, ways for people to stay involved in your project. <clears throat> so you may, um you may have people coming in as developers you may have people coming in as users and what are the what are the things that will make them come into your project and stay involved so not every project that come and not every person that comes into your project will necessarily take on a leadership role in the future but how can you help people to see how they can be involved regardless of what their, what their resources, skill level or motivations are. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. For me, a pathway is less about the picture on the left where there's this golden highway that takes you to where the sun shines behind the mountain. And it's more about something like a treasure map where uh, someone might look at the map and say, oh, I wanna go you know, have a look at the river. And then someone else might say, I'm really fond of forests. And someone else might say, well, I'm going to take the little boat that's out there and go across the ocean to the other side of the peninsula. Um, so there are many different ways that people can, can be involved. And there's no um, expectation of a leadership progression. Why are personas and pathways important? And the way that I see it is um, personas will bring the right people to your project and pathways will help them to stay there. Uh, just getting back to when do you develop them, it's optimal to develop them at the beginning of your project. It might save you um, a lot of time if you are thinking about who you are developing this project for from the beginning and also what you want them to do there and thinking about your project in terms of how it will grow um, and what you will need as the project go, grow and what you can offer your users and, and your contributors. So typically you can develop uh, personas and pathways at the beginning. And then of course, as I mentioned before, use the data that you gather as the project grows, as new voices join your project 
to improve those. The next slide is um, just an image of the design thinking process. And I really like this one. I think um, there's a lot of questions here that might be useful to your projects beyond just thinking about pathways and personas. Um, and what I wanted to show here is that projects, I, I sometimes get the feeling that in open science, every project will just work, like it has to work, right? Because we invest so much time and effort and emotion into it. But the reality is um, sometimes projects, when you come get past the prototype stage, you have to sit back and really think about whether this is the thing that was going to be, you know, do solve the problem that you set out to solve. And just going back to the drawing board and looking again at your users, looking again at your, at your contributors, uh, who did you think you were going to attract? Who are you really attracting? And how you can edit that? I really, um, I really like this one. I think I'm going to be using this just in thinking about our own projects as well. But personas typically fit into after gathering the data through your exploration and empathizing um, at, in the step where you are defining what specific needs are that a person has that is coming to your project. One of the things that we've used in one of our projects, the AfriMap R project, to think about who our users and contributors could be are a, a mind map showing all the roles that there are in a project. Um, and the reason why I'm showing you this mind map is because as you Google for information about developing personas, you might cut across a lot of references that speaks about developing uh, personas from a company's point of view point of view to attract users and to get um, the right um, the right uh, elements into a platform or a software or a project for the users. So really mostly about users. But in open science projects and very uh, specifically in open communities and software development, we have not only have to think about our customer, the person that will be using our tool or our platform or will be joining the community as a community member, but we also have to think about personas and uh, pathways for people who are developing. I apologize for my dog barking in the background. Um, we, we have to think about our contributors, our community developers, um, and other roles, not only the users. So this kind of mind map has helped me a lot to think about personas from a user point of view, uh, from the learner's point of view, and then also how can we attract uh, developers and what, what are we giving to them, how are we motivating them to join the project and what, uh, what reward are they getting here and how they, are, they can use being involved in our project to grow their own skills and networks as well. Um, another tool that I've used in a, in a different project is the Escalator project. Um, here we used uh, existing monitor and evaluation, evaluation tools to figure out who our target, target audience may be. Who, who are we developing this project for? I'm going to talk about the project a little bit later uh, or just in the next slide. But first we started with um, using a fishbone diagram to define our problem very carefully. So asking a lot of whys, why do we see this problem? And the problem that we were seeing were, was in South Africa, we have um, several groups that are working in digital humanities and computational social sciences, but we don't have a community of practice. We don't have a community um, that get together, that speaks to each other, that shares knowledge um, in South Africa in, in digital humanities, computational social sciences. So that was our problem. And then we were saying, so what? Well, why do we have, like, why do we care if we have a community or not a community? What are the benefits of having a community of practice? Um, and needless to say, there are so many, many uh, benefits of having that community of practice. So it wasn't hard to, de to decide whether we should take this project. But then thinking about using the fishbone diagram, which I don't have an uh, image here, but you can Google for that, um, just to think about why are we seeing this problem? 
Um, and that really helped us to identify groups of people who could benefit from, from this project. And then after developing the, the Fishburne diagram, we use the theory of change, which is also a really, really good tool, especially for people who are developing um, community projects where, they, where you want to see a change in communities. Um, it's a really lovely tool to, to consider using in your project. Because as you are going through asking these questions, you really also start to identify groups of people um, which can inform your personas because you're asking questions in a different way. So just quickly, a theory of change, you take your project, your problem, and figure out what is the impact that you would like to see, which will address that problem. And then you work backwards towards what are the long-term outcomes that will lead to this impact. To have those long-term outcomes, what are the short-term outcomes that you should see? And then what are the outputs that you will need to see the short-term outcomes? And then what are the activities that you have to do to create the outputs that will lead to the short-term outcomes and so forth? And then really what do you need as inputs to be able to do the activities that will lead to the outputs? Really work backwards from the big problem and the impact that you wanna, wanna see. And by doing that, it has helped us a lot to define groups of people um, and, and very specific, um, you know, I can see the, the personas now who we are going to attract in this project and support in this project and also who can help us, um, help, us help contribute and pr provide leadership in this project. Um, another thing that I want to point to you for those of you who are involved in uh, change projects, in community change projects, is just at the bottom of the slide, the time that it takes to see certain changes. Um, just for us to be realistic, I mean, the OLS projects are only three months, and some of, some of us expect to see changes that, that really in communities takes many years to take place. So just to be realistic and a bit uh, more uh, so softer on, on yourself when you are not seeing the change that you would like to see. The theory of change for uh, the project is called Escalator, and it's uh, and one of the one of the flagstone activities of this project is to develop a digital champions initiative. And what we realized initially, we thought we'll just run one mentorship program, very much like OLS. There will be a there will be a mentorship program, and we're going to open it up to people doing research um, in digital humanities and computational sciences, and we're going to teach them digital and computational skills to do to use in their research. But as we worked through the theory of change um, and through the through the fishbone diagram, we realized that there are people who um, who are not very comfortable using technology, even in day to day management of their, their work. Um, expecting someone to learn to code in Python when they haven't really used something like Google Docs or um, um, some of the other tools that that you zoom or other tools. Uh, which means online learning is probably uh, a challenge and working alone, probably not part of many communities. So we develop um, a different type of, of mentorship program and, and it's also not necessarily um, mentorship in the way that you see here in OLS to address very specific needs. And in the slide, you can see that we now have six, six tracks and we're busy developing content for those tracks and also partnering with existing mentorship programs to see how we can build on work that exists. Um, here's just another, speaking about pathways again, and I'm, I'm almost finished. Um, I found this, when I was thinking about pathways and this whole idea of not all pathways in, uh, not all participants in an open project goes to leadership. Um, I found this, this lovely app by All Trails, which shows all kinds of different hiking routes in your area, and then how difficult it is, how long it is, um, how much elevation, the time it will take you to finish it, um, and, and various other filters. And I really liked it. I thought it was quite um, a good um, uh, example of what I mean. 
just to give you some numbers, in a recent study um, on open databases in GitHub, they found that for the major open source database projects, more than 19,000 people had contributed to a project's main repository at least once, which means like once in the entire life of the project. Only about 30% of them, of 30% people had contributed in the last year, which are called active um, contributors. And only about 20% had contributed more than three commits to a repo. And you can imagine for, for all of you working um, on your project, how many commits have you made to your repo and how many other people have committed. And just realizing that when people are coming to your project, they may only do one, one change. Um, and that will be used, that will be useful to your project. And you should, you know, value them um, and, and make everyone feel that their contribution is valuable um, even if they don't go on to become very really i just want to show you this uh, image which I, which I found from uh in the microsoft um what is it called the microsoft inclusive design manual which i thought was really really lovely and i do share a link there on this slide um if you design for people who have the biggest challenges to contribute or to be part of your project you are just reaching so many more people who um, as you can see here for example if you design for someone uh, who are, who is blind um, you you can all also support people who may have a temporary problem like a cataract um, and also someone who have a situational problem like a distracted driver so it's really 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 beneficial to your projects to think about the most difficult way uh, the, the the biggest difficulty that someone will have to contribute and if you solve that you really make it easy easier even for your most qualified contributors or um, participants so in summary um as you'll see online there are many ways to develop personas and pathways and i do give a link just in the next slide to resources that's provided by OLS as well that um, can make you think about your personas and pathways. Um, there's a lot of information that you can put in there and there's a lot of personas that you can develop for. Be realistic, remember that open, open projects are often have limited resources. As long as I think for the moment and that you would like to, be, to do more as the project grows, that should be okay um and of course your inclusivity will grow as your project uh, diversity grows and there's just a nice quote respects the one value if we were all forced to pick one um that designers should have respect the user's time dignity ability and means and this was by um, a facebook developer Federico mm -hmm. francione so now uh what malvika and them have asked is that you think about um how your favorite open source projects have probably used personas and pathways to attract and retain you in the project and then there's also um for this week you'll have to develop your personas and pathways for your project and there's a link there and the links are also in the document um i think that's not slide. thank you very much i went over time sorry um yes thank you for your time Oh, thank you so much, Anilda. Um, it was very, I liked a lot the images that you used, the pathways and hiking. Do we have time for questions, Yo, Malika? I think we're not really. we? Sorry for that. We are a bit, right? so I think, thanks a lot, Anilda. I think, so if you have any questions and comments, please put them in the, in the document and Anilda, you can answer them uh, directly in the document. I think, yeah, I wanted to also, uh, yeah, you can put, uh, yeah, thanks again, Anelda. Um, we will move to the next point that is the breakout discussions. So uh, the question is about the value exchange. So we will have a 10 minutes breakout sessions um, where you need to ref you will reflect on what you are giving to your community organization or project 
and what is it giving you back to you and if there is any any gaps uh, how you might close them um so for for that we gave you some in some possible questions um that could help you to 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 with the discussions um you you could choose two or three of them um on that and so each room will be assigned with three members um please uh, agree at the beginning if you prefer to use the document or the chat room if you are in a written room in a written room and you have uh, each of you have so it's not five minutes but probably two and a half minutes each to write down your your answers uh two minutes oh, yeah two and a half minutes to write down your answers and then afterwards you can discuss uh in the remaining time uh, in the next five minutes uh to uh, yeah um go through the notes and stuff um yo are the rooms ready okay sounds good so you will send you in the rooms and we are back in 10 minutes then Um, I was just saying that uh, we, yeah, we're, we're a bit short on time today, so unfortunately we don't have time to sort of ask everyone to reflect out, but um, uh, the notes are there for you uh, and uh, co-created by all of you, so I hope you can take some time after this call in your own time to read a bit sort of what other folks have thought about as well during this time, and I, I hope that was helpful to you. Um, in this last bit of today, we're gonna try and put everything that you've learned um, to, and reflected on today uh, together into some frameworks that and, and tips that will hopefully help you action on, um, yeah, some of those things that you thought about. So I'm gonna start introducing sort of the first framework and then Berenice will follow um, and we'll try and keep this nice and short and brief, but the slides are there. Uh, please do read it if you want to find out more yourself. We're going to go super fast, so <laughs> apologies for this in advance. Um, so mountain of engagement. Uh, this technique is introduced to me for, by our very own Malvika, and I've since used it at least five to six times. Incredibly helpful for me to structure my thinking around um, community engagement and pathways that Anelda also mentioned already. So um, I'm, I hope and, and I think we're all aware of this kind of management levels within you know your typical organization you have members and leaders with different responsibilities and tasks and delegations and completion um, and there are also opportunities for people to be get appraisals to get promoted to have more leadership ability and feel recognized for their work um, similarly you can imagine in the community this type of structure do exist implicitly or explicitly um, and so it is important for us to think a little bit about, you know, how people interact within your community, the organization, uh, the project and its culture, um, discover how people can move between different types of interactions and develop pathways for people to move from sort of first contact, which is the, the lower level of engagement to um, sustained engagement to leadership. So uh, speeding through this, <laughs> uh, you can construct your mountain of engagement in five steps. You start with a list of all the people's interactions in your work. This could be things like, you know, following you on Twitter to writing a blog post for your project to attending a community call, list everything. Um, and then try and um, create bands of engagement. So uh, think about, you know, whether how much time or how much effort this takes and how engaged they are correspondingly, and then group these interactions into your bands and then give each of them a name. So it could be like first contact or sustained participation to like the top level five there usually is leadership. And then look at how folks are moving between these different levels, um, identify what work and what doesn't work. This is gonna be a lot the longest process once you've sort of, um, I would say it never ends basically <laughs> once you construct your mountain. You constantly need to be asking your community and you know, sort of getting a sense of how you can modify these so that people can actually effectively um, climb up the mountain. 
um, and use that insight to prioritize your work to create more opportunities. So as I said, I've gone through this really, really quickly. The rest of the slide deck has a lot of questions that you can use to ask yourself um, and your community to basically um, do more of that step four and step five type of work, but that's the gist. I hope I give you a quick overview um, of, of what's happening here and what this technique and what it's useful for. And if you have further questions, you know, please approach any of us, um, Malvika, Yo, Berenice and myself, and probably others in the cohort as well. And we're all familiar um, with this technique um, to some extent. So uh, handing over to Berenice to talk about welcoming new contributors to projects. Okay, thanks. So I will be also uh, short, trying to be short. So here yeah, is more a practical way how you can welcome new contributors and engage them and empower them in your project. So I will share some things. Um, so Anelda already discussed about um, so but the pathway here is more on the mentorship side. So how you can mentor your contributors. Uh, to build the pathway through their pro through your project, from the first interaction to leaderships. Um, whoop, sorry, wrong. Um, so first things is how you attract contributors. So you created pathways, but how you can also you need to document your project. You learn about readme contributing uh, files, the code of conduct, license roadmap are really good tools or practical things you need to add to your project. Um, one of the things that is really helpful to attract contributors is to create small tutorials on how to contribute to your project. Label your issues on your GitHub repository, if you have a GitHub or GitLab repository or any other, to, to say which, um, which issue should, could be easily solved by, by new contributors. So you can li label them newcomer friendly, help pointed, first time only, first timer only, to be sure that these uh, issues are um, done by people that uh, are not are not so much familiar with your project. Another thing that is really helpful is to organize collaboration events so, or co-fest where the people can come and learn how to contribute to your project and they, they have people that can help them there. Um, then what is good also is to, when you have new contributors, is monitoring your contribution. So when your new contributor comes, they need to, it's good that they have support on how to get started, where to find the help, have clear requirements in each of the issues, um, what are the requirements for solving these issues, and point to relevant information when needed, so contributing deadlines and others. And so when a new contributor arrives, it's really great if you could welcome them and point to these resources. So either you do it manually for each of the contribution, but you have also some welcome boards that you can uh, um, link to your GitHub repository that could uh, point that automatically to the people. Um, one of the things that is make the commitment to respond to inquiries. So it, it requires times, but it's helpful for the people that are not feeling um, that they are doing the work for nothing. Um, and once they contributed or submitting a pull request or GitHub or on GitLab, uh, thank them for their work because they did something at least. And they take the time to learn how to do that. And it's really, um, yeah, I think it's the most important things. Give good, consistent and helpful feedback during the review. So both uh, good, uh, positive also, and also sometimes the negative feedbacks is also important. Ask questions about what they have done, guide them, highlight their work on your project. So put them on GitHub or social media. Have a list of contributors is also useful when you, where you can highlight the contributors, even if it's just fixing a small issue, a small, um, I mean, small mistakes or small, uh, how to say, uh, yeah, uh, small things. Point them to a good next issue task that they can do for the that they can become more and more. Uh, uh, they can you can empower them, and then you have you can go to the next step. So continuing monitoring. So how you can you can empower more and more your contributors. So being available. What are the time? What how much time they have and how they want to to you can you need to learn from them that. 
Um, I will not go through the details here because we are really short in time, but you have the detail there about what you can do. Um, provide ongoing support. So monitor any channel or chat channel that you have, answer any newcomers questions, provide guidance and guidelines, connect people with other members because you are not the only one that can guide them or mentor them. There is other contributors in your project, hopefully, and then they can help others. And organize really community events that are really greatly great welcome support and mentor new contributors. For me, it was really the main things uh, that I learned from the different projects I'm involved in. <clears throat> Establish clear expectations, pathway, and, and personal, I think it's all really great. Uh, communicate regularly, so give feedbacks to, the, to your contributors and, and yeah, involve them also in, in, different, um, in the different decisions that can be taken. Provide structures through the review process, encourage constantly them and, provide, and give them um, some more and more leadership then and model best practices. And um, there are some questions. So if there are an issue, you can start monitoring today and do you need to set up a chat channel uh, or something where the people could ask their question? And should you monitor any of your current contributors to take more roles in your project? It was really quick, but I think you can learn a lot. For, I mean, it's really it was really helpful for me for my projects uh, to 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 use to apply this practice this small trick there, and get more people there. Thanks, Amy. You can. Yeah, I don't thank have you. The end. <laughs> thank you very much, Berenice. Um, yeah, sorry, flew through that, folks. Uh, lots to digest. I'm also we're also one minute over the hour already. So if you need to log off, please do now. Um, we have a couple of assignments for you. One of them mentioned already by Anelda. Um, there are, um, you know, if you can complete some personas and pathways, ideally with your community together, then that would be awesome, and fantastic. If not, you know, I guess the most important thing actually. Uh, we'd like you to do is to think about your presentations and graduation. Um, we have next week three rehearsal calls, I think Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday. Um, the times are in the calendar. Um, you, need, you need to, um, I think, put your name down for one of them. Um, check your email. Thank you, Malvika. <laughs> check your emails uh, for further instructions and details. If, if anything is unclear, yeah. just give us a shout on Slack. Um, loads to read from this call, so I hope you can, you know, take the time to do it. And again, we're we're here, so let us know um, if you have any questions or if there's any thoughts and comments that you'd like to share after. All right, thank you. Um, hope to see you all next week. Thank you so much to our two guest speakers and everyone for attending. <laughs>